Good morning to everyone. What a privilege and a blessing it is for us to be here this morning. Amen. Amen. God has been good to us. I want to welcome those of us who are here this morning. It's a blessing to be in the house of worship. Amen. Amen. And we do have the privilege and uh, the freedom to worship God unmolested. So we need, to, we need to take advantage of every opportunity that comes our way. For those of you who love titles, I've entitled the message, Lesser is Better. And uh, I want to put out a disclaimer. At the end of this message, I'll be making an appeal. In other words, I'll be making a call for the Lord. And if God speaks to you during this message, please don't hesitate. It's the best decision that you can make to surrender all to Christ. Amen? Amen. I invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for being so good to us. And as I stand before your people, speak to me, through me, and for me. May we receive a message that will draw us closer to you, that your name will be glorified, and we in turn will be blessed. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, Diego, I don't mind you leaving, but what are you going to do with the lemon tree? <laughs> I'm going to miss my lemons. God is good. Amen. Amen. I know what it feels like when I told my church back home many years ago, I believe 28 years ago, that this will be my last Sabbath, worshiping with you. I thank God that we have joined his camp, and we will meet again, amen? Amen. It's never goodbyes, but until we meet again. Amen. amen. Lesser uh, <coughs> is better. I turn your attention to the book of Hebrews, or scripture reading, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. Paul, the author of the book of Hebrews, says, Now faith is the substance of, him, of things for for the evidence of things not seen. One of the key words in this passage is substance. And I never understood what this meant when I came into the church in my teenage years. But it has always been read and quoted. But no one really explained it to me what does it mean. And then someone said to me, this is not what faith is, this is simply what faith does. But what does that mean? If this is what faith does and not what faith is, well then what is faith? And then I was told that faith does not provide a remedy but simply receives it. So what is really faith? Then I turned to the book of Matthew. 8 and Luke 7, and I found out that a centurion soldier came to Christ one day and he made a request for healing for his servant. And after the, the discourse, uh, he said to Jesus, I don't need you to come to my house because see, I'm a man under authority. And I said to one, go and he goes. And I said to another, come and he comes. And then he said to Jesus, you just speak the word only, and my servant will be healed. Now I've come to the conclusion that if we can discover what the centurion soldier had, 
we have found faith. Because according to Jesus, I have not seen so great faith, no, not in Israel. So if we can discover what he had, we have found faith. Amen? Amen. Now faith is a substance. It comes from a Greek word, hypostasis. You hear about hypoglycemic, hypotensive, low blood sugar, low blood pressure. You hear about the word subway or submarine. Hippo means under. And stasis means to stand. So translated in English, it means to understand. It's an understanding. So when the centurion soldier said to Jesus, I have an understanding with my servants. When I say to one go, he goes. When I say to another come, he comes. We have an understanding. So faith is the understanding of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. In other words, Jesus is saying to us, do you understand what I'm saying? Do you get it? Because God can never lie, amen? amen. And my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So if you have an understanding of who God is and what, does, what He says and what He means, we have found faith. We cannot have a blind faith. We need to have an intelligent faith, amen? An understanding with God. And our next passage is taken from the book of Lamentations. Yes, that's the book in the Bible, amen? And the, 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 the name speaks for itself. It, it's the lament. It was written by the prophet Jeremiah, who was called a weeping prophet. And the entire book of Lamentations is, is a, a written on the tears, on the hardship. It is written during one of the worst periods of uh, uh, God's people and their history. Uh, it was written on a difficult time, very sad. So you find this um, all through the book of Lamentations. But one verse I would like to ask to zero on is um, chapter 3 and verse 32. But though he caused grief, yet when he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. Though he caused grief, yet will he have compassion. Now I want to read it in a clear word. I don't usually use other versions, but I just want to read this in a clear word. And uh, listen to what this scholar had to say on Lamentations. Chapter 3 and verse 32. I'll be reading verse 31 and 32 in the clear word. It says, The Lord is full of compassion and does not cast us off forever. He permits a lesser evil in order to prevent a greater evil that will come. He permits a lesser evil in order to prevent a greater evil that would come. He brings sorrow, but it is mingled with compassion and unending mercy. Amen. Now, now, now this, um, this puts a little more light on um, when we are going to grief and sorrow when we are going to the crucible, in a sense, the, 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 the devil is not really in charge of evil. Yeah. It's as though God snatched it from his hands and said, give me that, you fool. And he distributes it. He says, you can have this, and you can have that, and you can have this, because he knows what we are able to bear him. God is really in control of everything, not the devil. Yeah. Everything is under his control. He did not 
train this world and just let them run on, on its own axle. He is in charge. He is in every place at the same time, at all times. He is going to where he has been coming from. And everything is as clear as daylight in the eyes of God. I want to remind us, my friend, that the Lord is full of compassion. Now my third passage is Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 8. Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 6 onwards. It's a very familiar passage of scripture. And it reads, Who being in the form of God, taught it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Speaking about Christ. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. We'll talk about this a little later in the message. Lamentations is one of the saddest books of the Bible. It is written by one of Israel's weeping prophet. See, the cup of iniquity was full. It was written around 586 BC, and the northern kingdoms had already fallen into a descent, and the southern kingdom did not learn, but they followed in the same tracks, and eventually. They all went astray away from God. So, so, so Jeremiah was talking to the, the southern kingdom. He was talking to the people of Jerusalem. And there were two good kings, Hezekiah and Josiah. But the southern kingdom followed the same trend of the northern kingdom. And listen to what it says in, 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 as we go back to the book of Lamentations. We want to look at a few verses and see what Jeremiah was facing. We look at chapter 1 and verse 1. It says, How did the city sit solitary that was full of people? How is she become as a widow? She that was great among the nations, and princess among the provinces, how is she become tributary? Verse 5, her adversaries are the chief, her enemies prosper, for the Lord had afflicted her for a multitude of her transgressions. Her children are gone into captivity before the enemy. Verse 15. The Lord had trodden on the foot all the mighty men in the midst of me. He had called an, an assembly against me to crush my young men. The Lord had trodden the virgin, the daughter of Judah, as in a wine press. Verse 16 says, For these things I weep. Mine eyes, my eyes run down with water, because the Comforter, the Holy Spirit is, is mentioned in the Old Testament, because the comforter that shall receive my soul is far from me. My children are desolate because the enemy prevailed. Chapter 2 and verse 6. And he had violently taken away his tabernacle as if it were a garden. He had destroyed his palaces of the assembly. The Lord had caused the solemn feasts and Sabbaths to be, to be forgotten in Zion. Verse 17 says, 
the Lord had done this. The Lord had done that which he had devised. He had filled his word that he had commanded in the days of old. Way back in Deuteronomy, God had given out the warning. If you go astray, if you withdraw from me, this will happen to you. They despised the warnings. Way back. And had not pity. And he had caused an enemy to rejoice over thee. He had set up the horn of thy adversaries. Chapter 3 and verse 8. Also when I cry and shout, he shut it out my prayers. Chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. Their vice, visage is black, blacker than the coal. They are not known in the streets. Their skin cleaveth to their bones. It is withered. It has become like a stick. It emaciated, very thin. Verse 9 says, They that be slain with a sword are better than they that be slain with hunger. For these pine away, stricken though, through of want of the fruits of the field. He paints a picture of declining vigor and vitality, of starvation, of chaos, of confusion. It's a very sobering picture that Jeremiah paints. How has it become like this? There is no food in the pantry. The church doors are shut. The Sabbath is not being kept. The prayers are not being answered. It doesn't go further than the ceiling. Our, our bellies are digesting our own children. There are no police patrolling the streets. The comforter does not comfort anymore. Our people are in prison. And then verse 32 says, But though he caused grief, yet he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. So all this happens, and, 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 and Jeremiah said, God is merciful. And the clear word says, He permits a lesser evil in order to prevent the greater evil that would come. In other words, if God doesn't send or allow the, the lesser evil, surely the greater evil will come. Now if you call this lesser, well then what could be the greater than this? I'm saying to us in this time in which we are going through, many of us have suffered the loss of loved ones. I remember when I prayed for my brother, and many of you prayed, he called Elder Ricky to pray, and, and uh, many pastors and elders from, from different states, and I prayed for an entire month, every single night, hoping and praying that the Lord would would make him come true. But then when I called to pray this particular night, his wife said, he's gone. And we were all hoping and praying that, that, that it would be a miracle and God's name would be glorified. Yeah. But he did not make it. And many of us. But the Lord is faithful. The Lord is full of compassion. Some people tend to get discouraged and they give up and they walk away from the Lord. But the Lord is full of compassion. You see, friend of mine, things we call terrible, God calls necessary. Things we call suffering, God calls preparation. Things we call greater, God calls lesser. Things we call tremendous loss, God calls tremendous gain or great gain. And things we call sacrifice, God calls service. There's a whole new paradigm here. So God is saying to Jeremiah, dry up your, your eyes, dry your tears, Jeremiah. It's going to be all right. I 
remember some years ago, and I told you the story, when I fell from the roof of my brother's house, on the driveway, flat on my back. What, I, what some of you did not know is that the house was built on an incline, so my brother had dug out. Um, so at the front of the house, when you look at it, it seems like a flat house. But at the back of the house was a two-story. So when I fell from the roof, I thought that was bad. As painful as it was, while I was falling headlong, I felt myself being turned in mid-air, and I landed on my back. God allows the lesser evil to prevent the greater evil. Amen? Because I could have fallen from at the back of the house. Amen? I think about Joseph, who was in a pit, treated illfully by his own brothers, who was sold as a slave, who ended up in prison being wrongfully accused, and all that Joseph went through, if that is the lesser, what could be greater than that? The greater, the greater is that he preserved his family from being starving, from being starved to death because of a famine. So what, what, what Joseph went through was lesser because the greater is his family could have died of starvation. And I said to myself, now Joseph reached to the place where he was Prime Minister of Egypt. He was the big kahuna. Amen? And my mind goes back to Potiphar. I wonder what Potiphar was thinking now. Or Potiphar's wife. Maybe they moved, maybe they changed residence. I went to a different state. But Joseph wasn't thinking about getting even, amen? All through the crucible, he was faithful to God. I'm trying to say to us this morning, when we think we are going through the terrible stuff, it's the lesser stuff. And I got good news for us. As hard as it might be, God cushions the lesser evil. If he does not allow the lesser evil, surely the greater evil will come. If we can only see things the way God sees it, we will have it no other way. Amen. Let me repeat that. If we can see things the way God sees it, we will have it no other way. Amen. He's always right. He's always just. He's always fair. He can never make a mistake. Amen? Amen. So thank God for the trials, for the crucible. I think about Naaman the leper, who was told to go and wash in the dirty, filthy Jordan River. Now, Naaman was no ordinary individual. He was a dignitary. He was captain of the Syrian army. And he did well with the king, his most trusted servant. But there was a sad commentary to his life. He had leper. He had leprosy. And he was told by the prophet of the Lord to go and wash in Jordan. As humiliating as that might be to Nehemiah, that was the lesser evil. Because the greater evil is, he could have died from leprosy. God is no respecter of persons, amen. You see, see, there was no power in the water. Power comes from doing what God says. Amen. 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 I think about
before the great apostle Paul, who before was called Saul of Tarsus, and uh, who sat on the feet of Gamaliel. Later on, he wrote 14 books of the New Testament after his conversion. But after his conversion, he made a request to the Lord three times to take away or remove the thorn from his flesh. And many believe that after his encounter with Christ on the Damascus Road, he could not see clearly, so he had a, a blurred vision. So three times he made a request for recovery, and God said, my grace is sufficient for thee. And Paul had to live the rest of his life with a thorn in the flesh. Now that was the lesser evil. Amen? Amen. The greater evil is that he could have been lost eternally. So whatever we are going through in life, whatever we are facing, as difficult as it might seem to us, that's the lesser evil. You, you, you might have suffered a miscarriage. And as painful and as disappointing it might have seemed, in the eyes of God, that's a lesser evil because if God had allowed the child to be born, it might have been a troubled child. It might have been a paraplegic or might be handicapped and you could not, could not have deal with that situation for the rest of your life. But God had allowed the lesser evil to prevent the greater evil. Amen? Amen. You, might have, you might have gone through a bitter divorce. That's the lesser evil because the greater evil is that one of you might have ended up dead or in prison. So thank God for the lesser evil, amen? All that happens to us passes before the eyes of God, before it comes to you and I. Mm -hmm. Nothing catches God by surprise. Amen. amen? And God never makes a mistake. So even though Paul found himself beaten, shipwrecked, in prison, beheaded, that was the lesser evil because at the conclusion of his life he said, he was able to say, I have fought a good fight. Amen? Amen. I have finished the course, I have set a pace. Henceforth, there is little for me, Amen. a crown of righteousness which the Lord shall give me on that day. And and he got thinking about you and I. He said, not to me only, but unto all those who love his appearing. Yeah. I think about the apostles of Christ, the twelve apostles. They all suffered a martyr's death. Followers of Christ. But then, that was the lesser evil. Because I read my Bible in Revelation 21, where it says, And the holy city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Amen? So they're going to be in glory. Amen? Amen. So whatever we are going through, friend of mine, thank God. And move on, amen. It's not a marathon, it's not a sprint, as we heard the story this morning. Uh, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon, amen. And the race is done for the swift. I saw my wife and I saw Tasia running a sprint this week, unbeknown to her. I was just at the traffic light at Granada on Wednesday, I believe, around 5, 6 o'clock. And I saw this, 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 this girl run like you said, boat. And my, my, wife and I said, my wife and I said, who is that? Lo and behold, it was Tassia. <laughs> she could have ended up straight in the beach, in the ocean, but that's me. You didn't, you didn't saw us, because you look, it didn't look right, you didn't look left. You set your face as a flip. Because you had a mission, amen? I'll be sorry. 